Welcome back to Second Breakfast. Today's episode, I am calling Girl of War, because today, folks, we are talking about God of War. Um, sorry, I just finished making soft pretzels from scratch for the first time, and I'm a little excited about that, and so I'm kind of riding the wave of that. I'm also riding the wave of how good this game was, Cam, <laughs> and I know I am, what, six years late to the party. The point of this episode is not going to be me telling you how good God of War is, because of course it is. You know that. Everyone said that. What I'm going to talk about here is my experience playing slash half playing this game and it will all make sense we've been doing a lot of game episodes lately cam's been talking about mostly it's been like cam telling me about a game that he's played and me reacting except for our diablo 4 coverage which was me and cam both playing that plus our friend tristan who comes on the show sometimes um but today this is this is gonna be me i'm running this show because i played this game and i also didn't play this game again it's gonna make sense (laughs) um Welcome to Second Breakfast. If you haven't been here, we talk about fantasy, uh, games, art, movies, TV, books, like all kinds of things that we just love. Whatever speaks to Whatever us. Whatever speaks to us. And right now what's speaking to me is God of War. It's Mimir on it's my belt. Mimir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me start off big, big time spoilers. If you haven't played this game, stop right now and go play it. Like cancel your life. Take two weeks off of work. Just <laughs> play this Buy game. Buy a PS5. Yeah, just do that. Um, I'm going to spoil everything. So keep that in mind. I think another important thing to start with is giving you all context about my gaming experience. I've talked about this on the show before, so I'm sorry if this is repeat information, but it's really important to my, what I'm going to talk about here. Um, When I was growing up, I didn't play games at all. My parents just didn't want us to have video games in the house. Um, Wasn't like a crazy thing. It was just, they wanted us to spend our time doing other things. I think also my mom told me as an adult now, she said she knew that if they got like any kind of gaming console that she and my dad would not be able to not play it. (laughs) And it would be like disastrous for our family. (laughs) so we just didn't have games growing up (laughs) my only gaming experience as a child was playing um the original mario on like the original nintendo um console at my grandparents house when i would occasionally go there for holidays which you did beat for the first time last night i did on my switch (laughs) did i use the rewind function that the switch now gives you i sure did but whatever i beat it um but that was like my only experience okay not until college not even college like after college they actually start playing games like that were beyond just side scrollers with a d-pad and a and b okay and so for a long time i was like games were not did not feel very accessible to me especially when there was as i call it the ones where you have to control the camera things that are 3d that was really a lot for me um the thing that really opened up this um avenue of being able to dive into these games that allow for more navigation and like 360 view and that sort of thing um was hogwarts legacy we're going to talk about that in a separate episode but that sort of i've sort of been dipping my toes into more what feel to me like more advanced games over the last year or so okay um but i'll still say i get i get so disoriented I have a really rough time with like knowing where I am in space and stuff. And I rely heavily on maps, but I am learning and I'm trying because I know that a lot of these games are things that I would really enjoy much like this one. I will say that I've been very impressed watching this progression (laughs) going from Diablo 3 and the original Mario to now being elbow deep in Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Baldur's Gate 3 video also coming or episode also coming, but that's a long way away because, you know, that's a huge, massive game. Um, But yeah, like it has been like a, like I'm slowly, slowly acquiring a taste and ability for more of these things. So I'm just going to start by sharing how good this game is because I need to get that off my chest and share it with the world. Again, (laughs) I'm not going to go too into it because everyone else has talked about this to death and I'm not going to add anything to the discussion. But I'm going to what I'm going to focus on right now is just this game was good for me personally. A lot of games have really great things like cool combat systems and cool fancy inventory things and ways to min max your stats and blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit about (laughs) any of that. Okay. What I care about is story, visuals and music. And that, all those things hit, and also just like feeling cool. All of those things I'm big hit on for feeling me. cool. I mm-hmm. mean, obviously the story in this game is what I think sets it apart from so many other games in this, like, is this an ARPG? Is that what we would call this? Help me. call it a third person character action with light RPG elements. Yeah, I guess it's not really RPG because you're playing a specific character and you don't really get to like role play in that way. But and you get to slight, there's a little build crafting with some yeah. of the gear, but yeah. Every game has a little bit of RPG sprinkled on top. Sure, yeah. But still, it 
it is so story focused and I loved that and it uh, like it's just be- this beautiful father and son story again we're sp- it's really best if you play this game not knowing anything. So for some reason you haven't played this, don't listen anymore because I'm going to ruin it for you. <laughs> but it's this father-son story. It's about emotional vulnerability, grief, storytelling as a whole, and mythology, destiny, and personal growth, and learning from your mistakes, and trying to be the person that you want to be. And it's about forgiveness and relationships. Like it's it's such a like sweeping, grand, epic story in that, and of course in the epic quality of the mythology angle that that's happening there but it also feels so like intimate and personal because it's really just between these two people there are a few other side characters that you grow really attached to and are vital to the story but it's really about Kratos and Atreus um and it's just such a gorgeous story and it's so rewarding and it goes so many places so obviously that's fantastic and then the visuals, of course, this 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 uh, movie. This I <laughs> call it, keep calling it a movie in my head. This game, it's incredibly cinematic. It I understand looks, that it looks so good. I mean, you know the the landscapes that we're seeing, even the the creature design of the of all the different like creatures you have to fight, and the and the character design of the your motion characters, capture. the motion capture, the costumes, the weapons, like it all looks so beautiful and it looks great the whole way through it looks great in the gameplay and in the um in the cutscenes because they're not even cutscenes, like because nothing cuts because it's <laughs> it's if you don't remember if you haven't seen the whole trick is that it's one shot the it's entire one, game it's one camera shot and so it transitions so seamlessly in between um uh gameplay and what you would call cutscenes or things where the the thing is playing for you like a movie and Cinematics. you're not involved. But it's not just those two. There's a lot of hybrid like scenes like that as well where there's still dialogue happening and things around you and the game is sort of you can only walk a certain direction but you're still uh, controlling Kratos walking. Like it's a lot of that. So that seamless um, transition between those two things is so incredible and innovative and really amazing to Can watch. I sprinkle a little information sprinkle in Sprinkle as much as you like throughout this whole thing. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking and you won't have any space. So just jump in. I love, just for context, I love this game so much that I, I could not lead an episode about it. So I'm very happy to be in the passenger seat here. Awesome. But apparently uh, the, the one shot thing is supposed to be a callback to Greek drama where oh, usually those yeah. plays take place in one like setting in, in real one time sequence. like yes, it's not exactly. like like you don't have in between scenes like time passes right, right. yeah that's that's very very so cool so it's paying homage to the greek mythology even as the franchise moves into norse mythology very cool very cool i also loved how the combat itself looks like it just looks so good like obviously like, the stuff you're doing is amazing but the way that uh, like his the way his axe moves and the creatures are jumping and the, and the, when you're like about to finish off like a big ogre or troll and you hit square you know and then he the, it like kind of cuts to him just like pulling his jaw down or there's like bits of slow mo like it just it all looks so amazing and what brings it all together is of course the fantastic Bear McCreary score this music is so good i keep i'm just listening to it constantly now like while i'm working and it's really fantastic very rousing while you're working i mean i always love bear mccreary right like of course he did outlander he also did the rings of power um he did the score for call of duty vanguard i didn't know that he also did the score for 10 cloverfield lane and also the walking dead i was looking into his he's done so much cool stuff anyway so he's a fantastic uh composer and the music is really special so like the game itself i was blown away just by how it looked how it felt the story everything and of course like um christopher judge and sunny soljic are doing such a good job carrying this story as our me as our main actors again doing that motion capture work we watched a cute little um uh documentary about the making of this game raising kratos it's free on youtube yeah it was it was okay, but the parts that were good were really good. And my favorite bits were the interviews with Sonny Soljic. He's so cute, He's just, and he looks exactly like Atreus, just with a different haircut. Um, I didn't realize how similar he looked to the kid, because you know, Christopher Judge doesn't really look like Kratos, like at all. <laughs> um, but I, I was, I didn't realize how closely the Sonny Soljic would look like Atreus. But anyway, it was, yeah, I like the game is great. Everybody knows that, right? But I want one of the most celebrated games of all time. Yeah, rightly so. Rightly so. But what I want to focus on here is my personal experience playing this game because I did this a little strangely. Cam played this game a year ago when he got a PS5. He, he had never had a PlayStation before, so Cam was sort of catching up on all the games he had missed. Um, 
growing up as an Xbox man. And <laughs> and you, I remember you you had an amazing experience with this game. I could see you sitting at your desk with the monitor up on there and you're just sitting there crying and, you know, having a great time with it. And I, you had told me how great it was. And I was like, yeah, I believe you, but that game's not for me. I can't, this two camera stuff and I, two combat, I can't do it. But now after the going through this journey of, playing more games and just sort of building my skills at being able to <laughs> navigate around a controller also by the way ps5 controllers are really big <laughs> my xbox controller i have like a kid size <laughs> which is really great for my small hands i have a tough time with the ps5 one but whatever we're learning we're getting there it's fine so i was like okay i think i can try it and cam was being very encouraging and nice about it and of course i'm playing on the easiest difficulty level like that's just always what i do except for like D- diablo 3 which i played a million times like there's no shame in that i played on no the there's not god of war i'm not saying there's any sh- i'm just saying that's what i always do if like, you that's tell a given me i'm me. a greek god and my character model looks like kratos and looks like christopher judge yeah. i want to feel like yeah. a greek god this when i'm in hard. combat <laughs> yeah exactly so i was like okay great and then i i played like the first you know i don't know 30 minutes which are just mind-blowing and just like introduce you to like oh this is the kind of game you're going to play. And I loved it. And so I was playing it and I was getting, as soon as the combat opened up, I was starting to have a bit of a tough time. The combat system is a little strange for me and um, it's just not what I'm used to. I mean, it felt cool. I loved like recalling the ax is still one of the greatest feelings in gameplay I've ever experienced. <laughs> so cool. And you know, I love the puzzles. I'm, I love solving a puzzle. Sometimes they got a bit too hard though. So like I played probably about, I want to say eight or 10 hours of this game. Does that sound about right? I got to the Lake of Nine, if you've played this game, and a little bit past that. No, I got past that. I got to the Lake of Nine, and then I went to that other place where they have to get the light of whatever. That, like, green place with the elves. Yeah, yeah. You played a good chunk of the game. I played a good chunk of the game, and I was really enjoying it, but in the last couple hours, I was starting to get really frustrated. Um, I was Again, the combat was really not clicking for me. Cam, you know, you kept saying just keep playing it and get used to it. And I was like, I'm really not getting used to it. <laughs> and some of the puzzles were getting to be a bit tough. And also the Lake of Nine, I really fumbled the Lake of Nine. Because, you know, you get there, that's when the game really opens up and that's when you can start to go on these side quests. The way that it is set up, so like you, you have that big bridge and then you can like go through the doors to like progress the story. I didn't know you could just go through the doors because there's these two like basins next to it where like Atreus is like, I got to find the runes to trains like this. And so I just thought that meant you couldn't get through the door. So I spent probably four hours doing side quests that I didn't need to do because I thought that I couldn't progress the story. Did you not enjoy the side content? I did, but I was like, this is grinding the story to a halt. I was like, we are trying to get these ashes to the top of the mountain and it's just not happening. (laughs) And so I was... I was just kind of getting frustrated. Then I like looked it up and finally, th- I'm not the only person this happened to. At least one other person on Reddit was like, <laughs> yeah, I just realized you can go through the door. I'm just stupid and thought it was locked. I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Anyway, so I did that and I got through, but I was just, I was not clicking with the game the way I had been at the beginning. I was finding the combat difficult. I was um, a little frustrated at how much the world had opened up. I, I, to me, felt like before I was ready <laughs> for it to open up. And um, the puzzles were getting tough. And I just, I kind of stopped clicking with the game. But I was so invested in the story that I wanted to keep going. I didn't want to just stop playing the game because I still recognized that it was so good. And I wanted to know what happened. And I didn't want to like, look it up. I'm not a monster. And so Cam very kindly offered, I, I forget how we figured this out. Basically, what ended up happening was Cam played the game and I sat there and directed the movements. That's what started happening. So basically, Cam had the controller in hand, um, but I decided where we went. I decided what puzzles we try and do not try, what what puzzles we go for, what loot we get. Every chest we opened, what (laughs) weapon we used for every encounter. You were directing all traffic. Yes. And that and also at the (laughs) one problem I was having was that I was getting a little bit seasick. And um, just like with all the movement, (laughs) the first time we did this, I genuinely became ill because I was sitting really close to the TV and Cam just like sprints you sprint everywhere and you turn so fast and I was like I need you to slow down so I had to like sit back further back on the couch and I was like you're not allowed to run anymore no more running and actually that solved the problem and I never felt sick again I have spent a lot of time in the the world of this series now obviously I played the entire first game with a lot of the end game and all the side content 
and all of Ragnarok, which is a much <laughs> bigger game. I went back and dabbled in the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. And no game that I have ever played, and I did grow up with games, so there's a huge library I'm referencing here. No game I've ever played has clicked with me like this one has. The yeah. combat, the exploration, the movement, the story, every element of it. So yes, replaying it, it feels so incredibly natural that <laughs> I do sprint around everywhere and it's frantic, but it all feels so responsive and natural that if I was just watching it, I wouldn't think that it looked like that. Yeah, no. That was I, an interesting thing to, yeah. to to see kind of the gulf between us there. Right, and I've seen you play other games like when you're, when you're playing Destiny or no, when you're playing Doom. Doom. I'm yeah. like, just looking at the screen for half a second, I want to throw up. I don't know how. It's so fast. And anyway, it doesn't matter. But so I, yeah. And so I found that to be really fun because what ended up happening was it was an experience that was a cross between playing a game and watching a movie. So it was like I was watching a movie, but I got to be a part of it, but not so much that I felt like I was playing a game. It was more like I just got to be involved and like so, and it wasn't like I was just like sitting on the couch like, passively watching like i you know phone was down i was completely in it and barking like, orders i was like it was basically like when you are learning how to drive and the instructor has a has a steering wheel also you know like it was kind of like that like cam was driving but i was also driving um and it was so wonderful because i never once was stressed about the combat because <laughs> what would happen was that i would get into a combat scenario and i would get overwhelmed and a little bit stressed and like it would kind of pull me out of it and i would like feel like i know i'm not doing this right and i know i haven't grasped this in the way i'm supposed to and i'm not getting the experience i'm supposed to be getting with cam doing all the combat i was getting i was getting the full experience it was great and i was still you know I would say, oh, for this, you should pull out your axe. Oh, for this, you should, spoiler, pull out your blades. Oh, for this, you should, you know, try doing your big thing where it sweeps everybody. So, like, I still got to think through the combat and, like, help decide how to tackle enemies. But I knew that you could handle it in a way that I <laughs> could not. Um, and so that was really, really fun. And um, And that was, like, you know... I have never experienced a game like that before. I've watched people play games a million times. That's what I did a lot in high school because I had no gaming experience and I knew I couldn't play a game. So I would like sit and watch my friends play. And that was fun, um, you know, because I'm still, I was still interested in the idea of a game and oh, where you, where should you go? That sort of thing. It was more abstract. Yeah, but I'd never done it in this active a way, especially because I had, you know, played the first eight or 10 hours by myself. Um, and it, so it was a really, it was a unique experience and I, and it still made me come away loving this game, even though I couldn't, maybe I could have, you, I didn't play it. I, I didn't play it the way you're supposed to play it. You absolutely could have played through the rest of it yourself. I, I said this to you <laughs> while we were doing it, but uh -huh. I think it, it might've taken you a little longer, but I saw, I mean, I would kind of peek over when you were playing the first chunk by yourself and I saw the way you progressed and grew and adjusted and Yes, it, it can feel frantic and like you're messing up and the stakes are too high and you don't want to mess up and have to go back yeah. and start things over. But <laughs> I have full confidence that you could have played through the rest of the game. You could play through all the side content right now. You could play through Ragnarok alone. I, I'm fully confident mm. in that. But I was very interested by this too because I've never played a game like this. And for a game that means so much to me, for a story that means so much to me, experiencing it again and with you was a, an incredible experience. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Because we've never, I mean, we played Diablo together. Like, we experienced Diablo 4 together, like, for the first time. But, like, that was different because we were our own characters. And that game is so much less story-focused. Like, we had never really done anything like this before. And it kind of, I kind of want to do it again. Um, I mean, I, this is where, this is maybe a question I'm going to get into a bit later, but like, where do I go from here? Like, do I play Ragnarok on my own? Do I rope you into playing it with me again? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, but it was a really fun experience because, you know, you and I often at the end of the day, sit down, turn the TV on and watch a movie, watch a show, engage in a story together in some way. But we don't usually play games like this together. If we're going to play a game together, it's going to be something like Diablo where we're just, you know, grinding and killing things and that's fun. It's not it's rare that we're experiencing a story like this together in this particular way. So it was a really fun experience. And also like the story was really impactful for me, but I certainly understood why it meant so much to you. And that was also, it felt special just to, to do that with you. If you listened to our fallout three episode that we did, uh, what was it? A few months ago now, yeah. 
that one was more me leading, uh, and it was talking about a game that came out in 2008 uh, that has all of these thematic overtures to my life at the time, and my mom getting cancer and ultimately dying a number of years later. And when I when I got the PS5, it was like the Ragnarok edition. So I got the, mm-hmm. the second, which is the sequel to this game. I got Ragnarok with the PS5. That's right. And I picked up the first game, which I'd heard amazing things about for like 10 bucks, mm-hmm. which is amazing that's, that's, that's crazy <laughs> and i picked that up and i got the first spider-man since those were like the landmark games that i had been missing out on and secretly coveting and right. resenting and anyway I, I played those and they both sort of changed my life and i think they're two of the best games i've ever experienced hmm. spider-man is a different conversation for a different day but god of war i thought was just going to be this great crunchy <laughs> third person action because it looked so fluid and brutal and yeah i mean entertaining and fun yes yeah, so like, oh it's and... gonna be fun and i'm gonna kill things and there's gonna be mythology and it's gonna be great which has always been the reputation for the franchise yes but when i start from the very first cutscene, yeah and it, the the mom is dead and you're gonna go scatter the ashes like oh <laughs> oh it's, <laughs> oh, it's one it's, of those oh it's gonna be that kind of game uh-huh. and it, on both counts it is one of the best iterations of grief art I've ever found. Yeah. And it is the best action I've ever experienced in a game. Yeah. I'm I'm so glad that you liked the action on top of everything else because that was something I struggled with. But I still loved getting to watch it. And again, because I was so invested in the story, I think that's why I kept getting really frustrated with the combat because the stakes felt so high. <laughs> Not only because I like, you know, wanted to progress in the game, but I was like, I didn't want to let my son down. Like it was that kind of thing. Like I felt so invested that when I wasn't doing well in the combat, it, it really, um, it felt devastating. I, you, you feel that more than I do to the point that you worry that the (laughs) animated pixels making up a companion character, (laughs) that they're like bored or mad at you. Yeah. I would always get stressed that I wasn't using Atreus enough. So I thought Atreus was going to feel sad or left out. Like I, I, or I like think that but, other characters in the game are going to think I'm dumb for taking too long or you something feel like that, that. In all sorts of games, I'm you just, you go that deep. I like, have a lot of feelings. <laughs> you locked out one of your you you locked one of your chickens in Stardew Valley out of the coop overnight accidentally. I'm still upset that she's so mad at me. And then it told you the next day that the chicken was <laughs> mad at you, and that like that affected you. It that truly day. did. Yeah, I've never. <laughs> I've never thought to have that feeling uh, in my life. Sorry, I'm more emotionally it, evolved than you are. <laughs> well, I'm trying to I'm trying to cross that bridge because the only time I've ever felt that is this game. Mm. There are, which is I think why I shotgunned these games so hard. Yeah, uh, part of it is the immersion of it being one shot all the way through. But I played the first game very intensely. Yeah, and uh, emotionally, it was it was ruinous in the best yeah. possible way. But even Ragnarok, I played non-stop for like most of a month because that's you thought this game was big that game is huge oh, okay. it easily could have been two games but wow I, I i lived in this world for a time but there are moments in this first game when atreus is snatched away mm. and kratos is running after oh, him god yeah those mm-hmm. moments i felt that like genuine sense of panic right yeah. racing after him in a way I've never felt in any game. It's 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 like this Corey Barlog tapped into this heightened suspension of disbelief that is I don't know, it's it's a belief in the story. It's a total immersion yeah. and embodiment in the emotions and actions of what's going on well, here. Well, and because you're playing the game, you're not just watching a movie. It, yeah. you, it feels like it is a part of you, so it feels very true. Like, obviously, you know it's not, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it feels so real. Like, I've played much harder games. I, I said before, I played this on easy. I've played much harder games or games without difficulty settings where it just is as hard as it is. Mm. But I have never had a white-knuckle experience like I did in God of War. Right. And so after after playing through this with you, I'm sort of left wondering why all games don't have such a strong story focus. I mean, not all games, obviously. Some games, the point is just the fun, killing the monsters and whatever. But I mean, I don't know. I've, I've never encountered another game like this. And I, I know it's not the only game, but I don't... I'm wondering why there aren't more like this. Because, I mean, a big part of it is that one-shot camera trick because that you know, with the integration between the cutscenes and dialogue and full gameplay, it made the story matter so much more 
you know, in other games, like even if the story is good, the story can feel so skippable and unnecessary because it's like you're playing the game and then like fade to black and then all of a sudden it's a cutscene and you're like, okay, 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 great. Even if it's good, you're like, this is not part of the game. This feels extra or like a good cherry on top. Um, like at no point in God of War did I want to skip a single moment of dialogue because that doesn't even feel like an option. Like, I'm sure it is you could skip through stuff, but I never felt the urge to. Even in something like Baldur's Gate 3 that I'm playing right now, where the story is excellent, I still find my... I skip through some of the dialogue sometimes because I'm like, yeah, and also I had the subtitles. It's also a hundred hour game. And I had the subtitles on, so I'm like, okay, I know what you're saying, blah, 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 you know. And the performances are good, but they're not as good as God of War. And so, you know, I just want to get back to the game. Mm -hmm. But in God of War, the dialogue is the game. Like, there's no separation between the dialogue scenes like the things that you cannot control and the things that you do nothing feels skippable it all feels so necessary even the moments where atreus and um kratos are like on the boat and they're talking and like the i think you said this on some episode of some other thing we did but if you didn't hear um you know they'll be on the boat and they're talking and it's like some story that um atreus is telling kratos about some god or they're talking about their the mom or whatever and if you arrive at your destination and dock the boat they'll stop having the conversation and say we'll finish this later i never wanted to i, I waited till the story was done before i got off the boat like i would sit just every like time idling in the boat until they finished their conversation enraptured because, because it feels so important and necessary and i have never experienced that in any other game and i don't know why that's not more prevalent i mean i guess is the answer money because <laughs> you got to pay good actors and stuff well I don't know. it's not even uh just a question of being able to pay good actors it's also just having the budget to do the full motion capture sure yeah to, i mean this this is an internal sony studio mm -hmm. uh, sony santa monica yeah so they have access to an incredible amount of money i mean if you just look at the the visual fidelity of this game it's hundreds of millions of dollars. Those those tentpole Sony games, I mean, this has sort of become the almost the cliche of what a first-party Sony game is, is mm. an over-the-shoulder third-person action game with an incredibly powerful, moving, sad story. Okay. That's where you get The Last of Us. Yes, right. So there are games like this. Yeah. I mean, the, there the, are other Sony games. Yeah. There is God of War. I would put spider-man there mm -hmm. that's third person action and i found the story incredibly moving at least in the first game i haven't played the second one yet mm. there's the last of us um uncharted has hit people in that way there are, there are plenty of games in that pantheon so i would say there are story games mm -hmm. that that focused but yeah. a lot of the it's it's weird it's weird how the, i mean it's almost an industry question that you're asking because when i was coming up a lot of the games i really really imprinted on were story based. The only thing I've ever really fallen in love with purely because of gameplay mm -hmm. is, I don't know, Diablo, Destiny, games like that where the story is there sometimes, <laughs> but it's the minute to minute gameplay. It's that loop that is so powerful yeah. and rewarding and addictive. But or it's also just like the world that you're in. Like, sure. like the setting of Diablo is so much fun. And even though if the story is kind of eh, it's like I'm just enjoying being in the world of Sanctuary. But so all the things I used to love, like Halo and Gears of War and those that I was coming up with, it was the story. It was the characters mm. that I loved so much. The mm. highlight of Gears of War is the camaraderie of the characters and the story twists and revelations. There are, there's one character death specifically I'm thinking of in the Gears of War series that is the mountaintop of like gaming experiences <laughs> for me, not counting something like God of War, but for formative moments in any media that mm. shaped me, it was some of those story moments. So okay. there are some, but the way the industry has kind of hollowed out now, there's like artistic indie games that right. can tell any sort of story and be experimental and risky. And then there are down the middle kind of a knockoff of Witcher 3 third person <laughs> action games with a hundred hours worth of side content yeah your open world Assassin's Creed all the Ubisoft games those those games yeah. there okay. are those and then there are the experimental indies in the same way we've sort of hollowed out the middle class <laughs> economically <laughs> sure. and then you just have the extremes on the other side okay that's kind of happened in games so I would say God of War kind of blew open this genre for both of us yeah but just because I'm a little more in touch with the larger um, shape of the industry and history yeah. of it, there are more games like this. All right. You just have to <laughs> maybe move outside your comfort zone. Sure. I think that's going to be what it what it should be. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, even, sorry, even like the Batman Arkham games. Mm -hmm. That's third person, over the shoulder, and most of the work, because I've played bits of those games, most of what you're doing is the detective work and the tools Hmm. and the, the, the enemies in that rogues gallery that's so powerful. I think you could find something to love in a lot of these franchises. Okay. And now that you are adept in that third person action thing, even, I mean, I, I guess I'm the only person in the world, but <laughs> I love the story in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Yeah. Uh-huh. I really enjoyed I was gonna that. Say, I feel like that is like the, the simplest, easiest, like next step for me because it's like, a, obviously it's the same Viking lore, Norse mythology stuff you'd be working with. Um, but it's, you know, I, I've always really admired the Assassin's Creed, um, franchise like i always love the historical act like there's a real attention to detail with the historical accuracy and just the different worlds that they're in and the different mythologies they're playing with it always has seemed really cool and just like the concept of jumping around on buildings and stuff is awesome and if you take there there are some games there are there are whole genres that have been reduced to podcast games right where people see how many (laughs) hours of gameplay they're gonna get and that'll decide whether or not they buy them. So the games yeah. are filled with stuff. Okay, and yeah. you can take the game seriously and tune into the story, or you can just go through the motions while you're listening to YouTube. Right, yeah. But there are, I mean, like the old Bethesda games. We did an episode on Fallout 3. We did an episode on Starfield. You can play those extremely passively and just follow the quest marker and check things off the list, and that'll please your lizard brain. But those are incredibly fully realized, rendered worlds you can get lost in. That's why Mm. people still love Skyrim. You can take those stories so seriously and create (laughs) your own stories within those worlds. Those can be the most story-rich games imaginable. Hmm. Or they can be passive (laughs) games. So I think you... You kind of have to squint harder at a lot of games. Mm. And I think you'll find more to love in the spirit of God of War, but... I don't know if we're ever going to top I mean, this yeah. experience. I don't think, I, I, yeah, my question here is not, what is the, a, another, you know, an equivalent to God of War? There isn't one. I think this is going to be like just, nothing can top this, I right? think the good thing is these games, meaning the reboot in 2018 and Ragnarok have been so successful mm. that Sony Santa Monica is going to keep making these for a while. So yeah. <laughs> There's well, more to look that's, forward to. That is really encouraging. Well, so my last thing I want to talk about, like thinking about what else I can play and what to do moving forward is to think about this accessibility thing that I'm constantly thinking about with games because so many games feel hard or inaccessible or unapproachable for me. Um, Like the worst feeling for me is when I'm playing a game and it's making me feel stupid. Like if I feel like I don't know what I'm supposed to do next, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I don't know how to solve this puzzle. I don't know how to work this combat system. Like that is a really awful feeling for me and I really hate when a game makes me feel like that. And those were some of the feelings I was starting to get um, as I was getting into to God of War, which is why we made that transition. And so I thought, okay, as much as I loved and adored this game, I was thinking about how could this game have been more accessible for me and me alone? I don't mean like access- accessible in terms of like, it's like accessibility leaps and bounds that it's making for people of all different abilities and stuff. I'm really just talking about me right now. Cause I have, I only have my experience to work with. Um, I think something that might've been help might've been helpful for me is more direct place markers. Like, most of the time, at least once you get so far in the game, you have a little compass telling you where to go, like where your next goal is. But sometimes you don't, especially when you're kind of like exploring. And I get, I'm telling you, I get <laughs> really turned around when I'm in a space and there's a, th- and it's 360 and I just, I, I get really lost. And so maybe like little, and these are all things that you would be able to toggle on and off. I know not everybody wants this, not everybody wants their hand held, I get it. But maybe like little place markers or at least let me zoom out a bit to get my bearings. That's what I often have a really hard time with, especially when I'm in like a anything with like walls or trees or like like a forest, like anything that's kind of enclosed. I just get really turned around. I'm like, okay, I just need to like zoom out and figure out where the hell I am right now. To orient yourself. Yeah. So yeah. like something I'm love I'm loving about Baldur's Gate three is that you can do that over the shoulder third person or you can zoom out to like iso- like f- like a little bit all the way to like isometric bird's eye. Like you can zoom out in all kinds of ways and that is so helpful for me. I don't want to stay in that bird's eye view while I'm playing, but the ability just to do that quickly be like, okay, I know where I am in space is so helpful. So I wish there had been something like that just to help me get my bearings a bit better. 
I think something else that would have been helpful is making the upgrades and runes and stuff easier to understand. I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to how that worked. Like it did not feel in, every time I went to the menu, it did not feel intuitive how I can apply the things I've picked up and like what they're going to do and what they cost. And even seeing how much resource I had when it would say like, you know, X number out of X number, it always seemed backwards to me. And like, I don't know, I just had a hard time understanding all of that. And that was also like frustrating. So I found myself kind of just not messing with it until you started playing for me. When you got the different runic abilities, uh -huh. I think you enjoyed those more when I, you unlock different I things. I enjoyed the unlocking of things. I just had a hard time with the functionality of like implementing them. Well, the, the runic attacks, they have that little measurement of it does more straight damage versus how much stun it does. Like yeah, that, that, that was measured reading out that, easier. That was helpful to understand, yeah. The gear upgrades were that unnecessary. Was, that was tough, yeah. And, and really the thing I had the hardest time with was the combat. I had, I just couldn't, I don't know why, but I just couldn't gel with it. Like I even tried, like there are different options in the game. You can switch to, um, the controls can be more like focused on the A, B, uh, X, Y buttons, but it still was, it still was confusing for me. Like I tried that for a bit and that still didn't work. Um, I'm just, cause like what really got complicated was as you progress, as you unlock more things and you get more experience, you can unlock combos. And I just can't, I just can't remember a combination. <laughs> I need one button to do one thing. That's what I need. I, I want RT to do one thing. I want, and also the other thing is I'm used to Xbox. And so in, you know, in <laughs> Xbox world, it's A, B, X, Y, and it's right bumper, right trigger, left bumper, left trigger. In, in PlayStation yeah, world, yeah. it's square triangle. I still don't know which one's where, and it's L1, R2. It, anyway. It, that's also just my own problem is like it'll like I'll like read the skill thing and I'll be like if you press R1 and then R2 I'm like ooh I'm lost <laughs> so part of that was just my own fault but even still the combos are just tough for me I just want one button to do one thing and so I just really had a hard time like getting the flow of it and getting used to it um, and so I just I think what I'm asking for honestly which is a very personal request I think I'm asking for the combat system to be exactly like the Diablo 3 combat system and then I will never forget anything <laughs> and then it'll be perfect or at least the ability the ability to assign any skill to any button because you can do that in Diablo 4 and I love that you can make any skill be any button and I wish you could be able to do that instead of like you're forced to have your main attack be your right trigger, which makes no sense. Or the other one, which was like, I don't know, the equivalent of your ex. It didn't make any sense. So that those are sort of my like biggest complaints and things that I think might have made me play the game solo. I think a couple of those things do come with time. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to learn some of that almost muscle memory to get comfortable yeah. with it. I tried. <laughs> no, it was I know. tough. <laughs> I know. And not everyone wants to like bang their head against the wall yeah. until they develop that as like a second nature thing. Some of that, I mean, some of those uh, concerns are addressed in Ragnarok. I remember okay. Ragnarok having more accessibility options and toggles and things you can control because the only thing I tripped on playing the games, and this was really more of a Ragnarok thing than the first one. I was shocked at how intuitive every moment of the first game felt for me. I don't know why. I mean, this is just personal preference, I guess, but mm. it felt like Cory Barlog thought exactly like I did mm. because the movement through the terrain, introducing new enemies, secrets, chests, I just felt, it felt so right to me. Every time I looked for something to be somewhere, that's where it was. Not, not that it was obvious. It just felt like it was perfectly tuned to the instincts I have developed in these type of games. Interesting. But there were, I tripped over more of the puzzles in Ragnarok and there are abilities where whoever your companion is can give you little hints when yeah. the game knows like, oh, it's been 30 seconds and he doesn't know he's supposed he to throw the hasn't figured it there. out, yeah. And the companions will start to give you hints or like go over and stand next to whatever you're supposed yeah. to. Yeah, Atreus does that a little bit in this one, but only for like some of them and only to a certain point. And that happens more. That's been kind of throughout the Sony first party games that has become more and more of a feature and more and more of an option. So cool. I think that that should smooth out some of this. Yeah. But some of it is uh, some of it is just sort of repetition and, and that getting ingrained in you. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, it was... With it the was, combat, anyway. Yeah, with the combat. It was just frustrating because it was like, I could tell it wasn't that it was too hard. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't that my difficulty setting was still not easy enough. I, it was just that I was not... 
I could not get comfortable with the combat system and I would just every time more than one enemy would appear I would just like forget everything and it would just be kind of too hard to like get my bearings and settle back in whereas in other games that I've played the combat feels so smooth and just easy to fall back and like that muscle memory is there and I just had a tougher time with this you one. are developing those muscles I mean yeah. I've, I've seen this just because I'm, I'm very interested watching the games you're playing and sort of this journey I find it very interesting but going from something like Hogwarts Legacy which has a pretty robust lock-on system yeah and because you're shooting spells it's yes it's third person action but it's lock-on ranged combat yeah to go from that to this much tighter third person <laughs> melee focused combat system yeah that is much more involved and i can see how that jump is overwhelming yeah it was hard there are certain games where i am um, like assassin's creed odyssey which is the one set in ancient greece i did a lot of archer combat in that one so it mm. was, was more zoomed out and it felt more relaxed versus something like valhalla mm -hmm. which i in the beginning of the game it gives you your father's axe <laughs> and i literally i just made up I, I, with some headcanon, I decided that was my only weapon. So I didn't use anything else the rest of the game. Uh, so that was all melee for like yeah. 100 hours. Wow. And the game would zoom out sometimes, which is a nice feature that they could have had here, I guess. Mm. But I think the stubbornness of the one shot maybe have, is why they don't play with the camera I, angle I, that much. I understand, but yeah. But yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think some of that is you're, you're getting there. Mm. But it is that is an even bigger adjustment. The, the chaos of the melee combat is a big jump from when you're training yourself on isometric games. I just think that yeah. is a bigger jump. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So I think, so this is like the question I'm always grappling with is, is this a me thing or does that even, should that even be a factor? Like it shouldn't be a me thing. Like, sh do you know what I'm saying? I like, think it's that whatever the first game that you play that's like this is, uh -huh. is going to be the one you kind of learn on it's yeah. going to be tougher because that's where you're developing those skills yeah. and tripping over all of those problems yeah. and just getting the ropes of things i think what this sort of starts to make me think about is i wish that games were more welcoming to people who have not played games like it before um and that is a conversation i'm going to really dive into when i do my hogwarts legacy episode um that was I, made because i be think they game. do that yes so well yep. that was the reason i was able to even pick up god of war was because i played hogwarts like i played a hundred hours of hogwarts legacy um but so i i i get that that was why i just didn't play games for so long because even after i you know moved out of my parents house and i could have you know gotten my hands on an xbox and like it, it, you had one in college but like i never wanted to sit down and play with you because i was like i have no idea what to even do and i felt so intimidated and i was like i'm gonna slow you down it's like embarrassing i don't know what i'm doing it's like, a learning curve yeah. like now i'm not embarrassed of my lack of experience i find it quite funny and you know it's fine and i know i'm learning um but it, i i felt so intimidated by so many games for so long and i really hate that <laughs> and i and i know that games now are working so much harder to be more accessible to people and i just want that to continue um because i find it really frustrating that you know i a an intelligent adult <laughs> who has played several games still had a hard time on the easiest easiest difficulty level just couldn't get my brain around the combat system like that is frustrating and it sucks that it made me feel dumb when I know I'm not dumb and I know the game is not smarter than me and that people who can play this game are not necessarily smarter than me. Of course not. It, it yeah. just, you know, it, that was frustrating to me. Um, but I still, my, what, to wrap this up, my point here is that the game was so good. The story was so good and it was so beautiful that I was still, I, I wanted to continue with this game even when I was experiencing those frustrations and I'm glad that I found a way to do it. Um, so my accessibility tool was my husband. Uh, <laughs> you all can find, figure out something for yourself if you're like me and having a hard time. Um, but this game is fantastic. Like, I, I don't mean to end this by harping on the game's accessibility no, features. No, it's Because that's, that's, you know, I'm learning, I'm figuring it out. And not every every game's job isn't to make it accessible for all. But I, I wish more games would. But even in spite of that, the game was spectacular. And I loved it. There's a uh, Moosebolheim 
is uh, you unlock the key to go there at some point during oh, the okay. campaign. It's uh, it's the big, I mean, it looks like hell, sort of, with all the magma and fire and stuff. Oh, cool. And when you go there, it's these series, these waves of combat challenges. And I played that at the end, uh, after beating the main campaign and cleaning up some of the side content, just because, like you, I was so enthralled with the story that I wanted every scrap of extra every line of dialogue i want to know if there was one more thing brock and sindri were going to say to each other i wanted to hear it <laughs> and i didn't do all of the side content mm-hmm. uh, I, uh some of it was just increasingly difficult combat just encounters grinding, like yeah. the valkyries um yeah i've which, heard people talk about that yeah, yeah i i didn't <laughs> do all of those i didn't even know that was like a thing until i had read other people talking about it but muspelheim was such a gauntlet of interesting quick varied combat challenges and i don't know if i did all of them but i did a lot of those Hmm. i felt like doing that was like going to the gym (laughs) inside the world of god of war So maybe i should do that before i try to play um ragnarok i learned a lot from that because Hmm. by that point i had both weapons in the game i I never really used the fists i know you can to like stun enemies but why would you use fists when you have blades and an axe the the leviathan axe. why would you do that (laughs) is incredible and yeah I found myself using the blades more and more, Mm. but even just it becoming second nature to be able to switch between those weapons on the fly, learning to parry, learning to, learning when to dodge. I just, I I felt like I developed those skills by just slamming my head against the wall Mm. in Muspelheim. Mm. And that, I feel like that beefed it up. So when I went into Ragnarok, which has more of everything, but particularly more story. Yeah. I felt like during the combat encounters, I was more capable. Well, and that's probably good because like I had said earlier, one thing that really brought me down with the combat was when I wasn't doing well, it would feel so devastating because the story was so important to me. Um, But so when you were doing that sort of like side quest stuff um, to sort of like beef up your abilities with not like abilities in the game, but your personal ability at playing the game. Did you, was there much story happening or did, did the story feel important, you know? Cause it's, not, I'm sure there's some story element to it, but. Yes. These, the side quests in God of War are more fleshed out and narrative than any of the other games we talked about by point of comparison. Oh, for sure. Third person I'm action. sure. Yeah. It's not go find this frying pan it's like actually the frying pan quest is great in witcher 3 <laughs> and you haven't played it i know it's just the reference it's very I rewarding have. i i believe you <laughs> you will by the way you will devour witcher 3 yeah i which, tried it many months ago right. i think i need to try it again. you are a very different gamer than you were then yeah but uh that that one will be very much your speed and skill level um cool i think as it was mine when i eventually got into that game but yeah, the, the side content is extremely meaningful. It is new locations. It is new chunks of story. It unlocks new features within the game. I, I thought it was really, really, really worthwhile, especially compared to most other games where I end up, I start doing everything and I end up just kind of traveling the main path and finishing the game. Yeah. Star Wars Jedi Survivor, as mm-hmm. an example, for third person action. I mean, that... That second game is about <laughs> as close to God as God of War as you can get. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it, I love it, of course. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of Uncharted in there. But in the second one, I felt a ton of the modern God of War. Oh, okay. And by the time I finished that, I'm not going back to do the side. <laughs> I mean, I really enjoyed my time with it. But yeah, I mean, I'm moving on my... to the next thing. God of War is very much worth doing the side okay. quest. Okay, okay cool. Um, It'll tell you basically if this is just a combat challenge. Okay. You know, like the Valkyries, I'm not considering that side quests. Okay. But when there's like, oh, here's a favor for Mimir you can go do. Those are absolutely well, yeah. worth it. I, I, I will die from Mimir, so it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, because that's like my, my final question is where do I go from here? Do I jump straight into Ragnarok? Do I try to sort of like like you're maybe suggesting is, work, you know, build up my skills with the combat and the gameplay and do some of these side quests and, and battle, what did you call them? Combat challenges? Yeah, yeah. Um, or do I jump into something like Assassin's Creed Valhalla or Witcher 3 or The Last of Us? Like, do I jump into something like that that's going to give me a similar feeling um, but is, like, expanding my my gameplay well, um, repertoire? I think that's a really good question for the audience. Yeah. Whether you're on YouTube, you're listening on the podcast, you can secondbreakfastpod.gmail.com, you can email us, or you can comment on those other platforms, Patreon. Uh, I think that's a great question for those people. But if I'm going to try to answer it, I would suggest that you try the side content and if mm-hmm. you bounce off it again, 
we jump into Ragnarok because <laughs> I know you <laughs> and the first half hour from Ragnarok will hook you in like half a dozen different ways and we will marathon that game. I believe it. I believe it. Okay. Well, cool. That's that's very exciting. The next move is more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, yes, but yeah, do please, if, you, if there are other games that you think, oh, based on what you said, I think you'll like this that I didn't mention, please tell us down below because I'm... I mean, I have a pretty good handle on the gaming world now, but like, I'm sure I'm only a tiny bit in. So like, there, there's a lot I don't know about, especially games that are like older than, you know, 2016. Like, I, I'm gonna need help. So um, tell me what I should play. Tell me what you want to see me talk about, what you want to see us talk about. Um, like I've hinted, we have a Hogwarts Legacy episode coming. We have a Baldur's Gate 3 episode coming. I don't know when that one's gonna happen because I've five. got so much left to play. But We have a lot of game episodes in the can as well that that's are true going I, to be I forget that they're out. not i forget what's coming out when yeah. but we're, we're doing this is our gaming year we're talking about games a lot this year and i'm really enjoying it so i haven't i don't think i've read a single book this year i've only been playing games we're reading game of thrones well that's true but like you know like <laughs> I, I just go through phase. sometimes mean. i'm reading all i'm doing is reading sometimes all i'm doing is games right now it's just games uh, so as i'm a little, really enjoying that as a little psa to close things out i found out like an hour ago that they did a novelization of the first God of War game. Oh. And they did an audiobook. Uh-huh. And it's narrated by the voice actor who pl- uh, played Mimir. <gasps> cool. Alistair Duncan. Cool. And I think it's that's available fun. on YouTube. Oh. So if you want more out. of this world, that's there. Well, that's lovely to hear. I like that. Very cool. All right. Well, let us know what you all thought of God of War, what you think of anything we've said. Again, share your um, game recommendations down below. And um, we'll look forward to seeing y'all on Friday for our new Game of Thrones book episode. And if you want even more episodes, go yes. over to Patreon, $2 a month. You support the show. Get one or more than one brand new bonus episodes every month and access to the whole back catalog of bonus episodes accumulated over two years. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Maggie, for leading us on this journey. Woo, it was fun. And we'll see you in just a few days with a brand new Game of Thrones discussion. Toodaloo.